This is a joint work uh, with Yassine Lefwili from um, uh, TC. And I need to say that this paper, it is, is a policy paper that is uh, partially based on a report commissioned by the European Commission, but the opinion expressed in this report are only those of the authors. And as I was mentioning, uh, this is going to be a policy paper uh, that perhaps, uh, and hopefully, is going to foster some uh, food for thought and uh, uh, create a path for uh, new research questions to, to be investigated. So in this, uh, in this audience, uh, uh, we are all familiar about uh, platforms. Uh, uh, platforms are intermediaries that allow interactions between uh, different group of agents. Uh, and some of these agents, uh, buyers and sellers, uh, uh, users, and advertisers sometimes can engage in uh, some illegal activities. You can think, for example, at uh, counterfeit items that are sold in uh, several e-commerce platforms. And this has, big, a big, this has become a big problem in recent years that even the OECD, uh, in a policy report a couple of years ago, wrote that uh, e-commerce platforms uh, now represent an ideal for storefront for counterfeiters. But you can also think, for example, at the hype infringing material that is present on so on hosting platform or hate speech on social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And this has also created some concerns among policymakers in recent years. Uh, platforms um, might have incentive to stop uh, illegal misconduct by third parties. These are third parties, these are direct wrongdoers, and they might have incentives to do so because we can think at screening and monitoring as a part of a platform governance. Uh, platform governance has been recently investigated um, in uh, the platform economic literature, for example, to control competition in uh, marketplace. So there are some recent paper by Ben Kasner in a GIO or Tao Tao Te in, uh, uh, that is forthcoming in uh, the American Economy Journal Micro. In a social media platform, so you might think, for example, uh, platforms uh, being interested in ensuring, in protecting advertisers from the presence of unsafe material that can damage their reputation. This is something that we investigate in a recent paper with uh, Martin Quinn. Or... Uh, platform screening can be part of a marketing strategy of a platform to position itself as a content, uh, uh, mo as a moderate or extreme content platform. There is a very nice paper by Liu Dirim and Zhang is a working paper. And finally, platforms uh, might engage in screening in order to protect some of its participants like right holders and brain donors. And this is something that we try to investigate in a work in progress uh, uh, with uh, Do Shinji on and uh, Yassine Fuli. More generally, platforms uh, may be willing to take some measure to stop illegal activities because reputation in this environment matters a lot. And reputation matters because it impacts the strength of the network externalities. However, even if platforms uh, uh, are active uh, and engage in screening, uh, the platform's incentives may differ from those of a welfare maximizing uh, social planner. And indeed are likely to be lower in a wide range of circumstances. To make an example, let us think, for example, at the platform that uh, needs to decide about its screening policy. In doing so, it will um, decide on the basis of um, its market reach, uh, the potential market reach operating at the margin about the next uh, users to attract. While instead, the social planners also cares about the externality that are exerted on those agents that are not part of the platform ecosystem. Again, you can think at social media platforms with users that are not present on the social media that can be harmed by hate speech. And we have uh, several examples uh, about that. Uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this possibility. Or for example, right holders and brain donors uh, that are outside the platform ecosystem and therefore the platform is failing to take into account uh, their presence. In, um, at the moment in Europe and in the US, the platforms uh, benefit from a safe harbor provision. Um, in the US, for example, under section 230 on the Communication Decency Act, that was approved in 1996, 
a platform are considered immune and they are they should not be held responsible for third party misconduct and therefore they can benefit from a safe harbor provision something very similar applies in europe under some restrictions and under the e-commerce directive of 2000 platforms can benefit from immunity this liability exemption uh, as long as they are passive and i will go back to this um, uh, to this notion a little on and under the so-called knowledge standard platforms are exempt they can benefit from liability exemption they can have immunity as long as they are not aware of illegal conduct that is committed on the platform and the moment they become aware of this illegal conduct they should act immediately otherwise they are going to lose the immunity and these liability regimes that are mainly liability exemption regime uh, were designed more than 20 years ago with a specific rationale, protect platforms from endless litigations, thereby stimulating investments by platforms in the very early phase of the internet. But in the last 20 years, things have changed even radically. And there are now several proposals on the table of policymakers. In Europe, in the last December, the European Commission proposed uh, the, uh, the Digital Services Act. Something very similar has been proposed by the UK government in the last April with the, online, the UK Online Safety Bill that mainly tailors social media platforms. And in the US, there is a discussion regarding changing, upgrading Section 230. Uh, there, there, was also, there were also tweets uh, and, uh, by Donald Trump in, uh, in the last months before his, uh, his ban. And uh, there are also proposals of, that mainly concern e-commerce platforms and the presence of unsafe uh, products being sold on these platforms. And the basic idea, the, the common understanding is that uh, the digital landscape changed in the last 20 years for several reasons. Some platforms now operate cross-border and therefore they allow interactions between vendors and buyers that are present, for example, in different jurisdictions. And this makes it harder for victims to sue wrongdoers that are present in other jurisdictions. Similarly, some platforms are no longer mere intermediaries now. They are active in the market and they provide complementary services. They recommend products, they sponsor products. And more generally, there are some platforms that are quite big, they have big pockets and they also have the resources, financial and technical, technical resources to engage in screening and potentially stop online misconduct. So if we want to upgrade and change the current liability regime, we may want to go back to the law and economic literature that has studied um, liability, mostly in traditional markets, where you have uh, bilateral relationship between buyers and sellers or manufacturers. And this literature has mainly focused on uh, how to incentivize sellers to exert uh, a higher level of care, more effort, more safety. And the, this literature has identified benefits of including introducing a liability regime, for example, when there are market failures, um, asymmetric information is a leading example, uh, consumers might not be aware of um, the level of safety of a product and therefore liability in this case can be uh, beneficial. Or again, when there are some harmed parties that are not participating in the transaction or when there, there is market power. And uh, my discussion, Catherine Spear, is a very nice paper with Hua last year in RAND that tackles uh, this dimension. But while liability can bring some social benefits, there are also some costs that are associated with the introduction of liability. For example, inefficient litigation costs. Parties uh, may simply not be able to reach uh, out of court settlements and therefore may need to go to court leading therefore to inefficient enforcement and litigation costs. Or simply given that the liability will entail more effort and therefore additional costs, these costs can be passed on to consumers and therefore the benefits of liability should be weighted against the cost that liability brings. Uh, this literature is more, is also 
uh, and this is where there are some important connections with the, with the platform environment. This literature has also identified conditions, for example, for imposing liability to parties that are not, uh, let's say, directly involved in, uh, into a crime or into something that can damage consumers. And again, uh, Katrina has a paper in ER with High in 2005, in which she shows that uh, consumer, it may be optimal to impose a liability on money manufacturers, uh, even when uh, a product is uh, sold to consumers and these consumers are intentionally causing harms to other consumers. And one way to do so is to, to, to make sure that there are some excellent incentives for the manufacturer and also to compensate victims is to impose, to complement a primary liability on consumers with residual liability on the manufacturer. But uh, there might be reasons to uh, to impose uh, a liability between direct wrongdoers, also when there are multiple infringers, or more generally when, uh, and this goes back to a very important paper by Krakman in, uh, in the Journal of Law and Economics, uh, when uh, you have um, an intermediary, you have a person, you have a party that uh, is in the condition to pre prevent uh, accident, to stop illegal activities by withholding support. And this is precisely what platforms can do, even though platforms are not directly the, uh, the wrongdoers, are uh, intermediaries that, because of their position, can potentially stop some misconduct. And in a platform environment in which we have uh, multiple parties, uh, multiple incentives, uh, there is not much investigation. And this is uh, where it is important to, to potentially contribute with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, our research on platform liability. And the, the economic effects uh, of platform li or liability in multi-sided markets are indeed uh, rather unexplored. And so far, there is only a non-formalized contribution, very important contribution by Buitain, uh, the Trey and Martin Pais last year that tries to tackle some of the uh, the problems that are also discussed uh, today. Before um, before continuing with the potential effects that uh, a stricter liability regime for platforms might entail, I might pause for a couple of minutes if there are some questions. So far, if there are okay, so no questions. So let us now uh, try to identify what are the potential effects that uh, uh, the introduction of a stricter liability regime for platforms might entail. And to do so, let us uh, identify a stricter platform liability regime as a liability regime that is based on a liability exemption that becomes simply costly, more costly to maintain. You can think, for example, at an exemption regime that requires platforms to comply with additional obligations. Otherwise, they are going to lose the immunity. And this additional obligation will entail additional precaution, additional screening, and therefore additional screening cost. And we might expect to have a twofold effect. For, certain, for, for sure, we are going to have some direct effect, the usual suspect, given that the platform will have to comply with a stricter liability regime, we may expect a reduction in the harm caused to consumers, to users, to third parties. But there are also indirect effects because we are living in a second best environment. And policymakers will only be able, to, or regulators, will only be able to control one instrument, the screening in intensity, leaving all the other instruments that are part of a platform governance completely free. And these are uh, the effects, the indirect effects that uh, we plan to uh, discuss uh, in the next slides. And in particular, we might expect some indirect effects on the pricing strategies of the platform, on the level of the activity on the platform, on the business models employed by the platform, on the creation of barriers to entry, terms of condition, and also platforms and third-party investments. Now, to start with, let us consider the canonical textbook example of a multi-sided market in which there is a platform that is allowing intermediation between users, buyers, 
and sellers. And among sellers, there might be some sellers that are legitimate and some sellers that can be malicious. They can sell unsafe products, they can sell counterfeit items, they can sell low quality imitations that are simply violating IP rights. Let us suppose that the platform is charging a membership fee to sellers and there is no cost to buyers. Now, if um, there is a stricter liability regime, the stricter liability regime will imply that the platform will need to start screening sellers more closely. For example, by acquiring additional documentation, verifying their identity, uh, verify the business data, and so on and so forth. And this implies indeed that there might be some uh, additional marginal cost of serving the sellers. And therefore, by increasing liability, by making stricter liability for the platforms, uh, we might expect that the commission fee, the membership fee charged to sellers is going to increase. And therefore, these liability costs are going to be passed on to sellers, at least partially, therefore leading fewer sellers to join the platform and abstracting from any value that the buyers might put on the screening activity of the platform, this might lead to fewer buyers participating in the market. So you can see that there are these cross-network externalities, the usual cross-network externalities that might amplify some of the effects that the liability might create. But let us now consider what might happen if, for example, buyers are also charged a commission fee. Now the platform might have an additional instrument. It might try to attract buyers with a discount. And then depending on the strength of the relative strength of the network externalities, participation of buyers might also increase. And therefore, this might mitigate the reduction in the number of, uh, in the number of sellers that are present on the platform because of a higher commission fee. This is just to say that uh, there might be many moving parts, business model are near neutral. So in the multi-sided markets, effects are not uh, uh, often uh, very clear. Now, Let's try to dig a bit more um, and let us, to let us consider an, an e-commerce platform, again, in which you have uh, original products that are selling uh, high quality products and um, you have vendors that uh, are selling uh, low quality imitations. And these imitations are imitations that are violating uh, IP, IP rights. Now, let us suppose that buyers uh, do not want counterfeits, IP infringers on the platform, because, for example, these low quality imitations can be considered as unsafe or simply because buyers have no taste for imitations. Now, in this environment, a stricter liability regime that entails more screening of counterfeiters would lead to have more, a higher expected utility for buyer participation on, on the platform and therefore more participation by buyers and therefore more legitimate seller participation. But things can be different if instead buyers to some extent benefit from the presence of counterfeiters. And there might be IP infringers, for example, that are illegal simply because they are infringing IPs, but are selling products that are safe for consumers and consumers have a taste for low quality safe imitations. In this case, a stricter liability regime managed to, to have a situation in which there is a lower expected utility for buyer participation on the e-commerce platform. And therefore we may expect fewer participation by buyers and therefore also fewer participation by legitimate sellers. Let us consider now a different platform environment and let us focus on an undefunded platform that can be, for example, a hosting platform like YouTube or a, pla a social media platform like uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram. And in this platform, there are some advertisers, uh, there is no price for the consumers, but the consumers perceive these ads as a nuisance, as a cost. Now, if there is a stricter liability regime because of the presence, for example, of illegal conduct or illegal content that are uploaded or generated by the users, 
then for the platform, each user will become more costly because basically the platform will have to screen the user activity. And this will reduce the net expected value of an additional user on the platform, creating the incentive for the platform to compensate for the screening cost by increasing the intensity, the number of ads displayed to users. And again, there might be this indirect effect. And given that users dislike ads, it is not clear what, what is going to be uh, the welfare impact, at least on the consumer side of the market. Another way to think at this problem them is to consider a situation in which um, uh, advertisers uh, care about um, the environment in which they are placed uh, because they would like to be protected from uh, brain safety issues. And there have been many scandals in the past years with the so-called adipocalypse in YouTube or many advertisers that last year decided to pull ads from Facebook because they were associated with uh, illegal uh, content or uh, um, hate speech. And then if we think uh, at uh, a liability regime that uh, entails more screening, then more screening is going to reduce the brand risk that advertisers may, say, may face, therefore giving a more surplus to advertisers. And the platform might try to extract this surplus by charging advertisers a higher price. And in the paper that, I, that we have with uh, Martin Quinn, we try to look at this dimension. And we also show that not only that there is a higher price uh, charged to advertisers, but there will be also more ads uh, being displayed to users. And therefore, also in this case, the net effect for the consumers is not going to be ex ante clear. While advertisers will be better off because of the reduction in the brand risk, consumers might eventually benefit from a stringent content moderation as a consequence of the stringent liability regime, but they will be exposed to a higher number of ads that creates a disutility for them. In the medium long run, platforms can also respond to a change in the liability regime by also changing their business model. Let us consider the two polar cases of agency model versus the wholesale model. In the agency model, the platform is an intermediary. Vendors are selling their products directly to the consumers. They are taking care of the logistic and there is no direct control of the product being sold by the product, by the platform owner simply because the product is not in the facility, in the warehouse of the platform. While instead, a whole, under the wholesale model, products are directly produced by the platform owner or they are sold by the platform owner, even if uh, by working as a retailer. And therefore, there may be the possibility for the platform owner to inspect, to verify, for example, the authenticity the safety, uh, the, doc the documents concerning a product. And indeed, we may expect that a stricter liability regime, other things equal, will make platforms uh, moving towards more integration, towards a hybrid business model, simply because it may lower the liability cost. It might be easier for the platform owner to inspect product and engage in screening activity. And also in this case, the social desirability of a dual business model is questioned. There is a discussion on uh, the social desirability of uh, such a model. But as an alternative to more integration, a uh, platform owner may also react by uh, changing the way they act in adjacent market. Uh, some platforms, uh, for example, Amazon, not only provide uh, allow intermediations between uh, buyers and sellers, but they also offer some complementary services like uh, fulfillment services or logistic. And again, um, if uh, a product being sold by third parties is actually in the premises, in the availability of the platform owner, because the platform owner is going Going to take care of the logistic, a stricter liability regime might incentivize the platform to impose or to require sellers uh, 
to join this fulfillment program because this is going to entail an uh, increased control over the product being sold in the market because it's going to be easier or cheaper for the platform owner to inspect, to screen out uh, the presence of uh, illegal products, illegal items. And we may have pros and cons also in this case. The pros are the usual, uh, uh, the, are the pros coming from a reduction in the double, double marginal because the platform will be active in two markets and there will be it will internalize the externality between the complementary logistic service and the primary one but there will be cons because there will be less competition for fulfillment services because the platform will engage in uh, will foreclose rival by engaging in time still on competition um, a strict liability regime is also likely to impact platform fixed cost. On the one hand, it might impact the marginal cost of serving users, sellers to control content. But uh, it might also be the case that uh, platforms uh, will have to develop some technology in order to carry out some ex ante verifi uh, verification. And this um, is a usual increase in the barrier to entry that can benefit uh, large incumbents uh, because they have been uh, operating for years under a different liability regime, but also because they will be able to, uh, to, to cope with the higher costs and they will better cope with the higher cost than entrance. But we'll also benefit existing platforms, especially those platforms that rely on a data-driven business model because these platforms may have already data regarding, for example, notices and takedown or flags by third parties. And this material can be used to better train the algorithm, therefore reducing the liability cost compared to entrance. And therefore, if a stricter liability regime is not uh, differentiated according to size, platforms of different sizes and competitive positions will not be affected equally, creating an incumbency advantage as it was shown, for example, for the GDPR. But there are, may, might be other ways for platforms to react, to respond to a stricter liability regime. For example, um, less privacy, platforms might start uh, removing online anonymity because they may have incentives to control, to better control users. And this is going to create an interplay with the current privacy regulations, or it might be possible that uh, the screening costs uh, are passed on to users, especially on zero pricing platforms, uh, via additional data monetization and less privacy. And this is something that uh, we are investigating in uh, a paper with uh, Nestor Dutch Brown, Yassi Lefwili, and Maciek Soboleski. Uh, there might be also other ways for platforms to uh, to adapt their terms of condition. And one way could be to neutralize liability by writing terms of condition to waive liability for victims, at least those that are participating in the platform ecosystem. But this requires market power because uh, um, otherwise platforms might be hardly attractive for users, but we might expect, for example, that courts and regulators uh, my challenge or might prevent these practices, but we need to keep an eye on this. Uh, and finally, we might expect that a stricter liability regime is going to affect third party and platform investments. For example, it may lead to more or less innovation by third parties like brain donors. And in, a, in an e-commerce platform, for example, Stricter liability might help brand donors to invest, to innovate, to increase their ex-ante investment because of protecting them from exposed competition by counterfeiters and from the reduced exposed litigation costs. But things can go the other way around. For example, if consumers value the presence of IP infringers, of counterfeiters, because they are providing, for example, some safe, low quality mutations. And if this leads to a demand contraction, there may be fewer, fewer incentives for 
uh, brain donors to develop uh, uh, new products and new innovation. And these negative effects are likely to be amplified if liability also entails a high commission fee for the brand owners. It is also important to take into account that um, um, uh, there might be some, uh, th there might be moral hazard in screening because uh, having a platform investing more in screening might crowd out uh, right holders incentives to screen and to monitor illegal conduct by uh, third parties. And also in this case, the net effect is not going to be ex ante clear, it's going to be dependent on uh, whether the investment in screening technology by third parties and platforms are going to be uh, complementary or duplicative instead. But we also expect an amplified positive direct effect. And this may come especially when platforms um, may, be, may be held liable for products that are unsafe. And um, one way to think at this uh, problem is that uh, suppose that the platform um, needs to invest, uh, needs to screen out uh, unsafe products. Now, given the, the fact that the platform uh, will have to screen out uh, unsafe products, uh, manufacturers uh, might have an incentive ex ante to further increase uh, their level of care. And therefore, there's going to be an amplified positive direct effect, not only because consumers will have exposed a safer product, but also the product will be safer as a consequence of the fact that the manufacturer will internalize platforms incentives. And finally, if we want to think about overall, uh, the overall impact of a stringent liability regime on platform investments, we may think at the investment in screening technology. There may be a new market for screening technologies, and these screening technologies can be developed in-house by the platforms. For example, uh, YouTube has been uh, running for years uh, content ID for content recognition, but there are also there is also a market uh, uh, with many third parties uh, that are operating, uh, uh, that are selling, that are licensing their technology to uh, many online platforms again, for content recognition. But if we want to think uh, more broadly at the effect on innovation, uh, there might be an effect on innovation via, via the ch channel of competition. And we know from seminal papers that the reduced competition as a consequence, for example, of a higher barrier to entry caused by higher, uh, uh, but by stricter liability regime might, might have an effect that can be detrimental or even positive on the level of innovation. And finally, we might expect also changes on the direction of innovation because platforms will have to allocate their resources towards their investments. And there might be a bias towards those investments that lower liability costs. And also in this case, it might be unclear whether this is going to be socially desirable. Now, having identified what are indirect effects that should be taken into account when designing a liability regime, along with the direct effect of uh, that a, a, a higher screening intensity has on uh, the level of care uh, accepted by the platform, there are some important uh, issues that should be considered by uh, policymakers, and we discussed this in the policy report. First of all, it is important to make sure that platforms uh, that have incentive to monitor are actually able to do so. And uh, for instance, as I was mentioning at the very beginning, in the European Union, the e-commerce directive um, allows platforms to benefit from uh, immunity, from liability exemption, as long as uh, they are not aware of illegal conduct. And this creates these incentives for platforms to take some proactive measures because this way they are not going to know whether uh, some illegal activities are carried out on the platform. And it is important indeed that uh, uh, a good Samaritan clause that has been uh, discussed, that is present in the US legislation, it has been discussed also in the report by Britain, the Australian Martin Pies is included. And this is something that finally now is present in the Digital Services Act proposed by the European Commission. 
Th there is another aspect that we have not discussed so far that concerns, for example, uh, the fact that uh, technologies are not perfect. There are errors and accuracy indeed is not, not perfect. And this might create incentives for platforms to over remove, indeed creating a type of one error. And given the fact that platforms might over remove, especially borderline content or borderline product, uh, there might be also an incentive by for right holders, competitors, or users that have different opinions to strategically flag, to strategically notice the platform regarding some conduct committed by others. And um, the Digital Services Act has a very important uh, uh, article on this topic because uh, grants platforms the possibility to oblige platform actually to suspend those users that are frequently submitting unfunded complaints and notices. The second aspect that I'm going to discuss is that it would be important to in introduce a liability to maintain the current liability exemption regime, but maintaining, uh, but it would be important to maintain this exemption regime subject to some procedural obligations that make platforms accountable to the general public. And one way to do this is to make sure that platforms have a simplified and transparent system to report the illicit material. But at the same time, there is control over the activity of the platform with the possibility to request feedback and to solicit the platforms. And at the same time, the platform should be responsive should be should timely respond to this solicitation it is also important that uh, uh, platform engage in transparency reporting and there is a, a very important uh, clause in uh, the dsa that not only includes some of these obligations but also imposes uh, data sharing uh, with authorities and researchers to very large platforms so those platforms that for their dimension and their for their role are quite big. And this is something that, that uh, can foster research, especially empirical uh, research, given the potential availability of data if the DSA is finally approved. And finally, there is a final aspect that I would like to discuss that is partially related to uh, the idea of having some large platforms and uh, tries to uh, consider to tackle the problem of having uh, the competition problem from having a one size fits all regime. Having a one size fits all regime is likely to amplify current asymmetries in the market and increase market power of leading platforms, of dominant platforms. So it would be important to include some additional clauses to big platforms, as the DSA and the UK online safety bill do, especially for what concerns risk mitigation activities. But something that we discuss in the report is that it might be important to make sure that these platforms also take some pro-social, pro-welfare actions. Like for example, sharing their past data and technology with small entrants. Uh, this might allow competition in the market, might also help entrants to prevent uh, online misconduct. That. And the reason is that if platforms that are big are subject to additional obligations and uh, are, they monitor their environment more closely, there might be an incentive of wrongdoers to move, to migrate towards small platforms that are not required to fulfill all these obligations. And therefore, if we want to make sure that uh, we are living in a safer environment, uh, it would be important to for this platform, small platforms, to, to have access to this data. And indeed, while preventing misconduct, also mantain, maintaining the contestability of this market. And then it is time to wrap up. So I, I hope that uh, this has created some interest for a rather unexplored area of research, which, which concerns liability for platforms. Uh, what we wanted to discuss is that there are many incentives, given that there are many parties, different business models, and therefore there are many theoretical and empirical issues 
to be investigated. From a policy point of view, uh, we conclude that uh, designing a liability regime is not an easy task because we are living in a second best environment. Policymakers and regulators can only affect one strategic variable while leaving all the other instruments uh, free uh, for the platform. And therefore, there might be unintended effects that should be taken into account. And also, there is a lot of interplay with other dimensions that do not concern illegal activities. There is an interplay with competition policy, privacy regulation, and consumer protection. And finally, the discussion today mostly focused on the economic dimension. But in social media platforms, and hosting platforms, we should also take into account a fundamental right, which is a freedom of speech. This is to say, uh, thanks a lot for your attention and I look forward for a Catherine discussion and any other comment. Uh, thank you, Leonardo, uh, very interesting presentation. So let's move on uh, to the discussion. Um, so today we have Catherine Spear joining us from Cambridge, US. So thanks for agreeing um, to keep a discussion so early in the morning for five minutes, and then I'll open up uh, for questions from the floor. Catherine, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm so pleased to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this very interesting paper. In the five minutes that I've been allotted, I'd like to do two things. First, I'd like to say a bit about the law and economics literature of liability, and then offer some general reactions uh, to the paper. There is a long literature going back several decades on whether firms should be held liable uh, for the harms that their economic activities cause and the form that liability should take. I think it's useful to distinguish two branches of the literature. In one branch, uh, the victims of the firm's activities are bystanders. And uh, so liability there would be a mechanism for controlling negative externalities on the bystanders. In another branch of the literature, the victims are the consumers of the firm. So they're willing participants in the economic activity. And in those settings, liability uh, is a mechanism for overcoming uh, market imperfections and frictions and contracting. I'm going to discuss each of these, um, each of these in turn. Um, so let's start with um, the setting where firms, while engaging in an economic activity, cause harm to bystanders. So for example, we might think about an oil company that causes an oil spill that harms the environment and harms local fishermen or other, other businesses. Now, there, of course, there's a strong economic argument for holding firms strictly liable in, in these types of settings. Strict liability, where the firms have to compensate the fishermen and the environment for all the harms caused, will induce the firm to take cost-justified precautions to avoid the harm. Moreover, since uh, the firms are internalizing the harms to the victims and the costs of their activity, they're going to scale back on the level of economic activity. And so liability in this setting can operate as a Pigouvian tax, forcing harmful industries to internalize those harms. Now, there also are downsides to using liability uh, in these types of settings. First, uh, liability is administratively costly. And indeed, with strict liability, there would be grounds for a lawsuit whenever a victim is harmed. So one could get a lot of volume of litigation. Secondly, and I think maybe relevant for, for platforms, if uh, a firm has market power, if it's an imperfectly competitive market, then the market may already be producing too little. And so imposing strict liability on a market could actually make the monopoly distortion worse. It can increase the deadweight loss. And so in situations like that, fault-based liability or the negligence rule may be preferable. I've just talked about firms harming bystanders. I think it's also relevant to think about another setting where the consumers of the firms harm bystanders while using the firm's product. Okay, so the firms are not harming the victims directly. It's indirectly through the consumers themselves. I think this is highly relevant, you know, broadly. You know, think about gun manufacturers. In the United States, there are more than 100,000 deaths and injuries from, uh, from guns every year. 
And so the question is, should gun manufacturers should be held liable? Well, there's a clear case for holding the consumers themselves liable when, when they've harmed others with the guns. You know, facing greater liability, consumers will take higher precautions and maybe lock away their guns to prevent accidents. And since liability increases the overall cost of gun ownership, consumers will buy fewer guns. So the activity level will tend to fall. Okay. We might want to hold gun manufacturers liable too. We may want to extend liability in situations where consumers do not have deep pockets, so they're judgment proof, or they're otherwise not fully internalizing all the harms that are caused by their guns. If firms are held liable for the residual damages caused by guns, then the price of guns will rise and fewer guns will be sold. And so in that way, the consumers and the firms will jointly internalize the harms to the bystanders. Now, I should also mention that holding firms liable for the harms caused by consumers can be problematic. Imagine a world where consumers are heterogeneous. There's some harmful consumer types, you know, maybe the criminals who are using the guns, and there are other safe consumer types, hunters who operate them safely. Uh, if the criminals have a higher willingness to pay for guns, well then holding the manufacturers of guns liable can be problematic. Insofar as the price of guns will rise to reflect the average harm caused by guns, as the prices of guns rises, it's going to drive out the hunters, the safe users, and then the criminals will be the ones who buy the guns. And so liability actually in the extreme can destroy a socially valuable market. And so this is something that one needs to be uh, you know, concerned about, some of these unintended consequences of liability. Now, I just talked about settings where it's the um, uh, bystanders who were harmed. There's also a literature, and this was the focus within uh, much of the paper, where consumers themselves or users on the platform or platform participants are harmed. Okay, imagine that victims are consumers of the firms. Okay, so it's uh, 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 consumers who are harmed by a firm's product. The economic benefits and harms are now within the value chain. And so in a well-functioning market, the harms to consumers should be largely internalized. And the case for liability on the firm is not as clear. Um, consumers are willing to pay a higher price for a safer product and firms have an incentive to maximize joint value and deliver optimally safe products. In these types of settings where it's the participants themselves or consumers who are harmed by products, then market failures, contracting frictions, other information asymmetries, that may suggest that product liability is necessary. It's necessary, for example, if consumers misperceive product risks or if product safety is an experienced good and not observed by consumers at the time of sale. Okay, um, I realize that, let me just take a couple of minutes and uh, give comments on the paper. First, I, I thought this was a really interesting project and it's provocative. The paper is overflowing with good ideas. And even though there are no formal models or empirical analysis, the paper really is helping to set the agenda for future academic research on this, in this area. Uh, this paper is highlighting the economic effects and trade-offs that policymakers should be taking into account when they're designing liability regimes. So some questions and some comments and suggestions. I think the paper might do a better job distinguishing between harms to platform bystanders and harms to the platform participants. This is a, an important theoretical distinction, and I think it would be helpful to a reader to understand and to see which of these the, the authors are talking about at various points in the paper. If the victims are the participants, then the paper might be more explicit and then underscore which market failures and contracting frictions are preventing the platform from achieving this joint efficiency. Um, the authors might also think about tweaking some of the terminology in the paper. The, the phrase liability cost in the paper is used very broadly to include litigation costs, but also compensatory transfers to the victims. If the victims are themselves part of the platform, if they're participants, 
then this could be neutralized through membership fees or transactions fees. And so theoretically, it's really important to, I think, break out those compensatory transfers when we're talking about harms to platform participants. Um, just to wrap up, um, I think a lot of the ideas in this paper can be developed into their own papers, hopefully with formal models and perhaps empirical support. This is such an exciting research agenda. And I am very much looking forward to seeing what else the, the authors do and how they pursue this project further. Thanks. <laughs>